Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. We all know that the global elite are trying to manipulate us, let's say. But we rarely go into trying to figure out how, like precisely what are the steps that they're taking. And I think we need to be aware of this so we can recognize it when it's actually happening. And we can try to, of course, avoid it and push back. But it requires connecting some dots. So I want to connect some dots for you right now on this video. Let's start by going over to Wikipedia. And I want to explore a topic with you that I've discussed on several of my whiteboard videos and on these live streams. It's called the foot in the door technique. And if you haven't heard about this, it's actually quite fascinating. And I'm going to scroll down and uh, just give you a specific example so you can get your head around uh, kind of the psychological phenomen phenomenon. When someone expresses support for an idea or a concept, that person is more likely to then remain consistent with the prior expression of support by committing to a more concrete fashion. In other words, once someone commits to something small, they're far more likely to commit to something larger. So understanding that this is how we're hardwired as human beings, you can actually condition people to be receptive to things that would seem absolutely ridiculous. Or you can, you can condition them to be open and actually accept things that from the outside looking in would seem unimaginable. Let's keep moving on here. A common example undertaken in research studies uses the foot in the door technique. Two groups are asked to place a very large, very unsightly sign in their front yard reading drive carefully. The members of one group have previously been approached and put a small sign in their front window reading be a safe driver. And almost all agreed. In one study, the response to the daily, excuse me, the drive carefully request, 76% of those who were initially asked to display a small sign complied. In comparison with only 17% of those in the other group, not exposed to the earlier, less onerous request. So this is getting a little bit wordy here, but basically what they did is they took two groups of people and they, and I've actually read studies where they took three groups of people. I think I can explain it a little bit better in Wikipedia here. <laughs> and for the first group of people, they didn't ask them to do anything as far as putting something in their front yard. The second group, they asked, they, uh, they took a group that actually said yes to doing something um, very small, but slightly different than what the big request was going to be at the end. And then the third group agreed to do something that was small, but very similar to what the big request would be. So going back to this example, talking about the sign in the, in the, in the driveway, uh, they came back to all three groups and said, hey, listen, now we want you to put this giant sign, this obnoxious sign in your yard that says, be a safe driver, let's say, just use that as an example. And uh, less than 20% of the people, I think it was 17%, I might be mixing these two studies, but they're very similar. Uh, less than 20% of the people agreed to put the giant obnoxious sign that didn't agree to do anything first. So less than 20%. Now the next group that agreed to do something small, but wasn't really similar to the big ask, it, it was right around 50%, if my memory serves me right, about 55%. But then the group that agreed to do the small thing that was very similar to the big ask, 76% of those people agreed to do it. So then they give you further examples, kind of real life here. So say that you've got a, a 
son or daughter, maybe a, a, a teenager or something. So they say, can I go over to Susie's house for an hour? Followed by, can I stay the night? So the request for, can I stay the night, is far more likely to be um, granted if the request to stay over at her house for an hour was granted. Can I borrow the car to go to the store? Can I borrow the car for the weekend? May I turn in the paper a few hours late? May I turn it in next week? And I would add, it's just two weeks to flatten the curve. Oh, yeah, it's actually uh, two years to flatten the curve. See, we have seen this play out. It, 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 a, a, a global psychological study. We have seen this play out right in front of our eyes in 2020, 2021, and now even into 2022 in the form of the Cervasa sickness. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And you guys at a front row seat to how this played out and how the politicians... Now, I guess there's an argument that this was unintentional, but the net result is still the same. And that's you ask people to do something small at first, and then the ask became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger to the point where you got people to inject a foreign substance into the body of their five-year-old. Now, let's just take this back. Let's go back to March of 2020. Or even February of 2020. If you would have asked those same people, hey, we want you to take this uh, experimental substance and inject it into the body of your five-year-old, how many of them would have said yes? That they would have told you to, that you're, you're a madman. That had told you to, to jump off a cliff. But yet those same people, after going through two weeks to flatten the curve, after going through lockdowns, after going through masks, after going through all these stages, those same people, a year and a half later, are not only willing to inject a foreign substance into their five-year-old, but demanding that other people do it as well. That's a perfect example of how the foot in the door technique actually works. It's a, it's a way to condition people to do what you want them to do, but you can't do it all at once. You got to do it slowly. Okay. I'm, I think, all of you get it that are on the live stream right now. Now let's connect a dot here. Let's move over to another Wikipedia post. And this is a group that I discussed the other day on the channel, the Club of Rome. It sounds like a conspiracy theory or some crazy thing you would see on James Bond movie or something, but it's not. It's, it's actual real group. Uh, they've got a website. Uh, I'm sure it's theclubofrome.com or something like that. If you just Google it, you can find their website. And they're active uh, today. And they started in 1972. And what brought them to prominence, and oh, and by the way, they're the featured speaker at the World Economic Forum uh, Davos meeting, the second or third one they did in 1973. So I believe that would have been the, the third, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, and here, founded by David Rockefeller, just for those of you who are interested. But um, they came to prominence with this uh, paper that was called The Limits to Growth. So what, what is the limit? You know, what's the, the big idea here? Uh, first and foremost, we need to understand that the Club of Rome believes that there are all these 
kind of global macro things that we need to change because there is a limit to the global resources. Therefore, there is a limit to not only economic growth, but the growth of the population. And that these, let's say, global macro issues are so important that we cannot leave them up to the individual or even individual states or cities or countries to handle this problem, that this needs to be completely centralized. Uh, because here, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but they said that if you leave this to the individual, uh, it was doomed to fail. So these objectives, these problems, uh, any solutions would be doomed to fail if they didn't come from basically a centralized global group of individuals. <laughs> however you want to, uh, you know, however you want to uh, describe that. So now let's go down here to the limits of growth. This again was this uh, paper that they did. And they actually created a computer simulation in 1972 based on this idea. So the Club of Rome uh, stimulated considerable public attention. Yeah, I stimulated. I don't know if I... I don't know if I'd use that word, but okay. Uh, with the first report to the club, The Limits of Growth, published in 1972, its computer simulation suggested that economic growth, and therefore population growth, uh, could not continue indefinitely because of resource depletion. And if you guys are saying, wow, this sounds a lot like Thomas Malthus, or Thomas Malthus, however you pronounce his name, and you would be correct. Uh, because the Club of Rome uses him as their inspiration. He's kind of like their uh, their Moses, if you will. Or maybe like, I, I hate to take it a step further, but you guys know what I'm talking about here. So this is their belief in summary. And the World Economic Forum that we know today has been heavily influenced by the Club of Rome. And so it's my belief that when they talk about climate change and how devastation this will be, really what's at the heart of this kind of, uh, well, what, what's at the heart of their obsession with demonizing climate change? And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be demonized, but, but their real objective here is to reduce consumption. And uh, by, by doing that explicitly and by doing that by reducing population growth. Now, some people would say by reducing population. I'll leave that up to you to decide. But definitely reducing population growth. They will explicitly come out and admit that that is one of their objectives. But my, Again, my point here is that the whole climate change and the whole, uh, you know, we need to be carbon net zero by 2050 – that's all just a Trojan horse. Uh, the, the bottom line is they want you to, they want to condition you to use less energy, to consume less, therefore get accustomed to not having economic GDP or uh, not having GDP growth and therefore having uh, the economy decline and the standard of living decline for humanity at large. This is their objective. Let's keep going down here. And so you may be asking yourself, well, what are they doing today? Well, as of 2017, there's been 43 reports to the club. These are peer-reviewed studies, commission, and they're all about the same thing. We need to reduce population growth. We need to reduce consumption. And uh, you know, whether they want to package that in the form of climate change or whatever, uh, this is usually what they do, but that's really their two main arguments. So uh, let's see. It looks like they commissioned an executive committee or suggested by a member of the group or of members by outside. Let's see here. Uh, let me back up here, guys. Sorry about that. 
These are peer-reviewed studies commissioned by the executive committee or suggested by a member or group of members or by outside individuals and institutions. The most recent is a paper called, Come On, Capitalism, Short-Termism, Population, and the Destruction of the Planet. So we've talked about foot in the front door, conditioning human beings. We've also talked about kind of a short background to the global elite that we have today. And I'm not just talking about the World Economic Forum. I'm talking about the IMF. I'm talking about Angela Merkel. I'm talking about uh, Macron. I'm talking about Trudeau. I'm talking about Biden. I'm talking about a lot of these politicians. If you guys saw the thumbnail for this video, that's what I'm talking about here. That's a visual representation of what I'm referring to. You've got the hand of the you know, World Economic Forum, and they're the puppeteer, and they're controlling the politicians who are then controlling the people below them. And so now let's move on and connect some more dots. We go to a story from Zero Hedge, and the title of this story is Germany scrambles to ration gas after refusing to make payments in rubles. So you could say, well, George, this makes sense. I mean, Germany's pushing back on Russia, and uh, you know they don't want to assist Russia in their invasion of Ukraine. That makes a lot of sense. But if you've got that pushback, if you've got that view, I don't think you're seeing the whole picture here. Because let's go back to these sanctions. If Germany really wanted to push back against Russia and not support their efforts in Ukraine or maybe de-dollarizing, then why didn't they sanction the gas in the first place? It makes you think, doesn't it? Why all of a sudden now, or why did they not ration the gas, but yet they just refuse to make the payments in rubles? Hmm. And then they're coming out and saying, well, they need to ration the gas. Maybe they see this as an opportunity. Maybe they're not letting a crisis go to waste. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge. I'm just giving you this as food for thought. Let's go down and read a little bit more. So the FT, the Financial Times, reported Wednesday that German energy minister Robert Habeck has activated the early warning phase of Germany's gas emergency law, which was adopted to help ration supplies in the face of severe shortages. And, and keep in mind, guys, the, these shortages are being self-imposed by Germany themselves on their own citizens. The decision will alert German consumers and businesses to do what they can to conserve energy. And if you read about this a little further, uh, you see that if this doesn't work, and if supplies still fall short, uh, more draconian, or excuse me, if supplies fall short and less draconian attempts to lower consumption do not work, the government would cut off certain parts of German industry from the grid and give preferential treatment to households. Or, so they say, or give preferential treatment to whomever they want. And it, you know, even if they give preferential treatment to house, that doesn't even make any sense because where are the households getting their money to pay the bill in the first place from the industry uh, that they're cutting off and putting out of business? You see? So now let's just go back here to the Club of Rome. And remember, uh, their big idea, if you want to call it that, is that 
there is a limit to growth. There's a limit to economic growth. There's a limit to population growth. And we need to have a centralized approach to limiting these things to make sure that we don't deplete our resources and destroy the globe or destroy nature, however you want to say it. So the, the dots I'm trying to connect here, guys, is, and I'm not saying this is happening. I'm saying, here's food for thought. We know that the global elite, their main two objectives are to reduce consumption and reduce population growth. They, they explicitly say this. And we know that what they've done in 2020, uh, and I, I'm sure they can access Wikipedia just like we can to see the foot in the front door theory, uh, that they understand that they can condition society and their populations to accept certain things that they otherwise would not accept. We also know that the global elite are on record of uh, stating that you never let a crisis go to waste. So is it a stretch to think that just maybe, just maybe, especially when Germany could have sanctioned Russian gas in the first place, but they didn't, and now all of a sudden they're saying, okay, we want to cut off the gas that we didn't sanction just because you're making us pay in rubles. Isn't it convenient that this also gives them the opportunity to condition their population to consume less and accept a lower standard of living. All right, guys, as always, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Stand up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. We'll see you in the next video.